Okay, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, we'll take some time for board comments. Anyone have, or questions um, for our staff? Would anyone like to begin? Mr. Lander? I want to thank everybody for their comments. I had an opportunity at open office hours to hear from a number of parents. Uh, I think my total was around 40. I don't know if I was the highest, but it was um, a good way to spend my last uh, open office hours. So thank you all so much. Uh, uh, before I uh, have a question for you, Ms. Johnson, I, I feel compelled to address um, the challenges and the guidelines that we face consistently in this community with the competing priorities. And uh, listening to uh, fellow parents, uh, community members, administrators, uh, over the past uh, eight years, you get a very diverse uh, spectrum of ideas, um, uh, speakers, uh, folks with uh, no college education, people with PhDs. I have a member of one of my advisory committees who actually is a rocket scientist. So it's, it's always interesting, the uh, uh, diverse collection of, of, of passionate people we have in Arlington. Uh, and, I say, and, I, and I preface all that, and of course, to say everything you, before but means nothing. Uh, the conversation about diversity still troubles me because consistently, no matter how much money their parents make, no matter how much no matter what language they speak at home, um, parents want an opportunity overwhelmingly. And we've sized this up at every grade level and every part of the county to have a school where they can walk their children to school. That is what has been overwhelmingly consistent. And as I stated from this dais and in personal conversations, um, our job is safety of your child and to educate them. Social engineering is an opportunity you have as a family. We have wonderful choice programs. <coughs> if you choose to bus your child to the most diverse school, and it's, it's always entertaining to hear parents from Immersion, from Montessori, from ATS tell us how wonderfully diverse their schools are, if that is true, then there are parents who have an opportunity to take advantage of that. There's also parents who want an opportunity when they work two jobs to walk their child to school and spend time with their child getting to hear about their day. Again, it doesn't matter how much money they make or the language they speak at home. Everyone overwhelmingly to all six of us here at this board and to the engaged staff consistently from folks all across the county talk about how important it is for um, uh, proximity and community. We heard families here this evening talk about having friends from elementary school to middle school and from middle school to high school. So we haven't as a board uh, obfuscated our responsibility to address diversity. Diversity means different things to different people. And that's the challenging conversation that I hope we continue to have in this community. But I hope that this board remains consistent and doesn't uh, negatively impact families by forcing busing on somebody else's child. And, and I feel the need to say that because the climate with busing has uh, gained some momentum. And I think it's dangerous and I think it's unproductive in support of education and instruction. And, and so, Dr. Johnson, I, I said all that because I think it was important that when staff planning looked at uh, the options, the feedback that you receive from the board, including myself after open office hours, could you just share with the community uh, the feedback? Because sometimes it is sort of all over the place, but with regard to what we hear at each grade level, with regard to proximity, continuity, okay. and walkability, maybe you could speak to um, what that type of response we, uh, that the school board received um, over the period of time that you've been doing this planning. 
Right, I think you've pretty much summed it up for us as well. So when we went to community meetings, some of them were larger. We went to, we had meetings at um, some apartment buildings that would be impacted by some of the decisions. We had meetings that were Spanish speaking only to make sure that parents had full access. We've got, we did stuff on surveys as well, as well as in the community meetings. And across the board, when we asked people whether we should actually apply all of the considerations consistently across the county, everyone said yes, and everyone wanted, I should say everyone, nearly almost everyone wanted to have a school where they're tr near where they live. So proximity came up across the board wherever we, had, wherever we went. Thank you, and then the last question I have is, is actually, and there's Dr. Nashris quietly hiding in the background, but Dr. Nashris and Dr. Murphy, um, I ask you again publicly for your commitment to ensure that no matter where you live in Arlington, no matter what school you go to, if you have an issue with your child's instruction, wherever they are on the spectrum, um, whether they have a special needs or whether they are, you know, need to be enrolled at George Mason, that your door is open, that the commitment to instruction, no matter where you live in Arlington, is consistent across grade levels and that parents have an opportunity to connect with you both and the director of teaching and learning. We had uh, uh, Mr. Bird here. I know he's a Cowboys fan. Yeah, there he is. Uh, and, and, and Wendy Pilch. Well, because they're going to, they see us this weekend. Um, uh, Wendy Pilch, director of elementary school education. I think it's important that folks know who you are and that you publicly affirm your commitment so that the excuses of, well, this child's parents only make a certain amount of money so they can't learn or you can't educate them, that those excuses will not be accepted at any school for any child any day. Can you just please reassure the board that? I, because I, I, okay, all right. Well, because because I think that sometimes with all the things that we have going on, as I said, safety and instruction are the two most important things, and I, I think we have to reaffirm and reassure the community that we haven't lost focus on that. Please. And I think, uh, Mr. Lander, uh, what you've stated, we all firmly believe and stand behind. But I think there's another element that um, I think needs to be brought to the forefront on that. And that's our principal leadership that we have in all of our schools that really f enforce that and carry that out on a daily basis, along with uh, the beliefs and the actions of our staff uh, and with our teachers in our classrooms and our assistants and the staff that support our schools, they really make that happen on a day to day basis. So, um, you know, I think one of the speakers, I believe Mr. Singer, uh, you know, most aptly pointed out that across the county there are multiple good choices and we see children flourishing in all of our schools and we're very proud of that. Right. And I agree with that. I just want to make sure that we acknowledge that how much money your parents make, what language you speak at home specifically, especially with targeted populations, that those aren't um, uh, barriers to or, or prerequisites for failure for students in Arlington Public Schools. I know that sometimes folks compare it to other school districts, but our commitment, I want to make sure that those things, when people talk about diversity, broadly, stereotypically, those targeted populations are the ones that's mentioned. So whether it's students with disabilities, students uh, of low social economic status, or students who speak a second language, or students of color, that our commitment is consistent and in, 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 in reinforced to those targeted populations specifically. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go with the vice chair next, Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Um, so. Um, James and I have had uh, robust conversations on this topic uh, in the past, and we will continue to do so, no doubt, in the future, including at this table. Um, and I've not heard anybody say that um, a child's, the income of a child's parent uh, is an impediment to learning. Uh, what I do say, and I do repeat, is that the workplace of the 21st century is telling us that when students leave Arlington Public Schools and enter the workforce, they need to be able to collaborate across diverse groups. And that is my interest in promoting demographic diversity. Um, so for many, many parts of the community who I have already spoken to and will be speaking to in the next month before we vote on this, 
I need to make clear um, what this policy 30-2.2 says and what it doesn't say. So I've heard a lot of people say that we have these criteria or goals or rules or priorities um, or core values or guiding principles. Uh, in fact, the policy does not represent the six considerations as any of those. The policy I'm going to quote says, school board's review of these proposed changes shall include but not be limited to the following considerations, and I won't list the six because everybody knows them, but they are considerations. They don't require us to prioritize them. They don't require us to take one and not the others. They don't require us to take all of them. They don't require us to um, put them in a certain order of priority. Uh, all, the, all this policy does is require us to consider them. And so speaking for myself, that's what I do and will do. Um, I, I'm going back to the diversity conversation. Um, if indeed we are going to have the kind of separation in um, school demographics that uh, Michael Beer pointed out at the podium a few minutes ago, then I think we should think seriously about taking diversity off of our core values and taking the demographics off of the considerations policy if it truly is not a value in this community and this board. Um, so I have one, I think, question for Dr. Johnson. Can you please briefly, I know you said that the rationale um, for the recommendation and how it relates to each of the six considerations would, could be found on the website. Did you say that in your, in your briefing? Yes. Uh, okay. Could you just briefly step through those and, and how the recommendation addresses each of them? Because the policy does say that, that, you know, when staff brings forward a recommendation, that'll, uh, they'll right. describe how. So I don't have, I cannot remember that, all of them off the top of my head in terms of the, in terms of the decision points. So what you'll find on the website is that we actually went through and for each of the considerations listed out um, how we were actually evaluating each of those different considerations. So I did not look at that before I came down. Um, what I can tell you is that for efficiency, we looked at it in terms of transportation. So whether or not we were, how many, what, whether or not students were able to walk or needed transportation to school. For proximity, we looked at the potential walk zones that have been developed. For stability, a number of parents took stability as meaning um, moving with groups of, of friends. Stability in our uh, considerations actually means that a student is not moved more than once per school level. So you, if there's a boundary change, it would affect you once in your elementary school, once in middle school, once in high school. Alignment had to do with not sending small groups of students from um, one school level to another Demographic specifically referred to the percentage of economically disadvantaged students, and contiguity had to do with um, having uh, boundaries and planning units that weren't separated by pockets, and so that everything should actually align when you look at it at the very end. Um, and again, on our website, you can go through and you can see you know, very clearly what decision points we used. Um, what we also did this time is all of the data that we've used for our decision making and making rec recommendations is online and it's been online from the beginning. So anything that we've done and anything that we've said, anyone from the community can go and look at that same data and, and draw their conclusions as well. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, all right, thank you very much. I, I may have a, another question okay, later. Okay, sure, um, Ms. Van Dorn. Good evening, <clears throat> Dr. Johnson, thank you. I just want to start by saying thank you and to um, Ms. Stengel and the entire planning staff, the entire APS staff for the amazing work on this. I want to remind everybody that we have not really done systematic boundary changes in Arlington since 2001 maybe, if not before that. So um, we're getting through it 
and it's impressive and I know it's hard and it's hard for the community but we'll get there so thank you for all your hard work because the thing I've heard consistently is that we're listening and I think that really matters because uh, we are the biggest small town I think on the face of the earth and our community matters and it's the reason all of our schools are great schools because everybody loves their schools and that makes for a strong community and strong schools um, so I just have some um, I'm trying to get it. We're, we're down to smaller units in terms of our questions, mm -hmm. so I just want to give you my input in terms of what I'm interested in addressing. The, um, I'm looking at the alignment of civic associations mm -hmm. uh, to the um, Clarendon Courthouse group. I happen to live in that area and understand what they're talking about. Um, 10th Street is an extremely dangerous street. It's one that... Um, uh, there have been many accidents on it for adults trying to cross that street. Um, and Washington Boulevard is as well, uh, even in that area, particularly in that area. And uh, we, I'm on the, uh, have, and the liaison to the Arlington Committee for Transportation Choices. And in that, we've created, they've created a, a walking map. And those streets are not crossable streets. So I, I would encourage us to strongly look at that neighborhood and, and what we're doing with that because it's, um, it's one that, as uh, one of the letters mentioned, um, back in the day when, when this map was originally drawn, it was a lot of blacktop, and it's not anymore. And those students have a cohort they go with, but more importantly, it's a safety issue. So I'm, I hope we really do look at that and see what we can, we can do with it. Um, there are two other areas that um, I am less familiar with, but uh, I'm just encouraging that we take a look at the Boulevard Manor mm -hmm. questions. Um, I don't know if we've had a chance to look at that. I, I'm yes. trying to sort through that. Um, and the East Falls Church questions that we've been getting a lot of correspondence mm -hmm. on. So at least I need to understand if there's a rationale not to address these, what that rationale is, what the numbers are. And I am less concerned with having exactly the same capacity at every school as I am to making keeping communities together and making walkable distances to school. I concur with Mr. Lander and that all of our schools are wonderful schools. Diversity comes in many different uh, ways. People have choices. Um, but for me, being able to walk to school and staying in community is very important. So I'm just pointing those three out because they're ones that if you'd like to comment, you can. If otherwise, just take that into account as, uh, well, it's going to be with us. I am giving my feedback. Uh, Dr. Murphy, is that sufficient feedback? Yeah, that, that's perfect. Okay. All right. uh, thank you very much. I, I very much want to thank everyone for coming out tonight um, and sharing your thoughts. And of course, um, thank Ms. Johnson and the full team. Not everyone is here, I think, at the moment, but um, you guys have put in so much work. We still have a month to go, but you have really um, brought us to a solid place in terms of the data, the information. Um, that's when we make this decision at the end of the day, it's important that we do it based on reliable information and um, the use of our considerations um, and uh, how different board members um, think about those considerations, um, you know, can vary, but what's important is that the information is solid um, and in really good shape, and I think that's really helpful. You've, you've done a terrific job. We're really, really pleased with that. Um, I was struck when some of the speakers uh, um, shared about, especially about their children. The first time I spoke at a school board meeting. The first time I came to a school board meeting was when my child was in kindergarten or first grade and it was about boundaries and my message was, you know, children are more than a number, they're more than a statistic, you know, you're talking about a child's life. And so I, I want to assure everyone that everyone at this dais is a parent, um, has experienced these kinds of things, has, we've all gone through middle school <laughs> um, and we've all survived. I, I was actually um, struck when I realized one day that in fact we've all sent our kids to different middle schools and we span all the major high schools across this board. Um, and it's one of the reasons that one of the things we are most solid on 
as a full board is um, the excellence of all of our schools and the opportunities that all of our schools provide. Um, and we very much appreciate that was very much the tone of this evening. There was no um, school versus school or neighborhood versus neighborhood kinds of comments. We do know that that happens out in the community. Um, that kind of commentary doesn't really influence us. Um, we really fundamentally reject those, that, that kind of um, comment when, when people um, try to pit schools and school populations against each other. Um, so that's, you know, just, I, I hope that you will all be assured that when we make this decision, um, we truly know um, and are thinking about, about the students. Having said that, um, one of the speakers I know mentioned that, you know, this, this is a very difficult process. It's very complex. There are many considerations. There are many schools, um, many, many factors, and in fact, trying to make them all work out, remembering that the fundamental point is to address the, the, the number of students in our schools and make sure that we don't have the crowding situation we have today. So it is very difficult, um, but um, you know, we are going to be proceeding with the best information we, we um, have. And you know, I do think that going forward we have a month. We have a public hearing in two weeks and a final decision. We, as a school board, can accept the recommendation as is, but we can also look at some of the areas that, that we've, we're still hearing concerns about, and I, I know that we want to. Um, so, so that'll be some work um, going on from here. We will you know, uh, ask some questions internally. Just so you all know, we cannot meet as a full board outside of the public arena. So there will not be <laughs> decisions made behind closed doors, but we will be having, asking those questions and getting more information, especially about some of the communities um, that, we, that we know there are still concerns about. So that will still be um, playing out. Um, Ms. Johnson, I do have a couple of questions I wanna ask then. Um, on one of the slides, and you don't need to pull it up, I know that you, you've, you're providing the capacity information for 2022, kind of five years from now. And, um, and, you know, we do want to, of course, you know, look at, at, at that um, outlook. But in 2019, when these schools open, I know you don't provide that data in the slides, but you do in the online material. Yes. I believe it's the case that none of the middle schools in 2019 are projected to be over 100% capacity. Is that correct? No. Let me see. And it is taking me a while, I'm sorry. I know, it's hard, you've got, you, you got the kind of before boundary changes and right. after boundary changes, 2019. So, so there are some schools, so Kenmore after the boundary change would be at 107. Okay. And Swanson would be at 103. Okay, all right, thank you. But it doesn't get up to, and, and then the, the student population continues to grow. Yes. And um, the fact is that in 2022, we have more students again than seats. So, yes. um, you know, that, that's kind of how that plays out. Um, I, I, a couple more quick questions. In 2019, we will have some schools that are under capacity. If families and, and the recommendation, which of course we, we also have to decide about moving all grades six, seven, and eight, um, would families of eighth graders at that point be able to apply for transfers if they want to for example, not um, uh, make that move. Again, I think that's something based on whatever decision is made about the boundaries uh, we would be willing to look at and evaluate. Um, you know, we would probably also be looking at potentially some type of lottery um, depending on the level of interest. So we would follow along with, you know, pretty much our standard operating procedures on these things. Right, and we only do that a year in advance, so right. as we go. And again, this board is very interested in encouraging transfer opportunities. So that's something that we'll uh, be uh, continuing to uh, look at. Absolutely, and I think that, um, you know, that's been pointed out by several board members uh, that uh, if there's the opportunity for transfers, that opens up uh, for families uh, to make various choices if they don't avail themselves to the option programs that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, and. Finally, I, I just uh, wanted to get back to the 
um, some of the comments we hear where, where people think, um, we, you know, we list these six considerations and um, hear comments like, well, you haven't really taken account of one or two of them. You're really only worried about certain ones. Um, I, I um, am pretty sure as I have followed the process along that um, you all do take all of those considerations into account when you have developed the scenario. So what happens is people see a final scenario and they don't necessarily know how many scenarios you've rejected right. or changes you are not doing because they might actually worsen certain considerations. So is, is that a, a, a fair yes. assessment of the process? Yes. So in fact, even before we've gotten to this point, all the considerations have been um, taken into account yes. and, and, and you've, you've done. And again, there are more than we can fully address. Um, at the end of the day, um, we do have, our, our school system is a neighborhood school system and we have, we have uh, great neighborhood schools. It's great for kids, it's good for the environment, and it's great for um, the fact that we have uh, bus pressures and um, walking really is, you know, um, I think a fundamental priority that, that I know many of our, you know, my board colleagues share. Um, so I, I think this is a really good start. I do think there are some tweaks that we're going to want to talk about going forward and we'll, we'll be taking a look at those. And um, are there any, yes, uh, Ms. Van I was just trying to find the information that uh, Dr. Cannon was referring to. On the website, mm -hmm. does it show the impact of the proposed, the superintendent's proposed uh, option A updated or revised uh, by school because I can't find that. Is it on there so that, because all I see is the map, but I don't see so what it looks like over the course of years for each school as it did for the other options. So Are we going to do that? or It's it's there. I mean, I can probably. It is there. Yeah. Okay, so, so I maybe, can, I can tell maybe you it could go. I can only find the map, so maybe it can get put right up front so people could look at their middle school and We'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at that and, and, and make, them, make the appropriate maybe moves. It's just me. Let's make yeah. it user friendly. Yeah. Yeah. People want to be able to get, at this point especially, there's it history of all there. the previous right. things that have been seen. Let's make it so that when <clears> someone <throat> clicks on it, they see this recommendation and the data associated with it. That we'll, would be we'll bring that up uh, on the engage and sort of update those materials there. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right, I think we're ready to move on to our next information item. I know many of you here came for this one, so, um, you know, I would just, uh, board members, board colleagues, would you like to take a, a five minute break or just go on through? No, yes. Uh, let's go on through. Wait. We can't decide anything around here. Let's, let's, let's go on through, but we would ask you to please um, uh, hold your conversations till you get out in the, the hall and talk to your friends then, and we will go on with the next item. Thank you all so much for coming out, those of you who are departing. Um, we will next hear about the proposed legislative package for 2018. Ms. Lilla Wise, come and on down. So Mr. Lander, I'm going to ask if you have a quick introduction of, of our speaker. Quick introduction, Lilla Wise, extraordinaire lobbyists on behalf of the Northern Virginia public school systems, including Arlington, Alexandria, City, Falls Church, City, yes. Um, we've had some good victories down in Richmond, depending on where you position yourself politically, but I think with regards to schools, we're in a good place, and hopefully um, once the state legislator gets uh, uh, the final word on what the balance is, we will be having a legislative breakfast um, coming up soon. And so uh, with uh, your list of initiatives before you off um, jet setting across the globe, you can share with us um, uh, the legislative package. I, I want to thank you sincerely for uh, working next to me these past eight years. This has been great. Uh, you are absolutely wonderful. and. And all of the good things they say about you in Richmond are true. Thank so uh, <laughs> I don't know if they say anything other than good, but I just wanted to make sure that it didn't get confused. So uh, thank you so much for your guidance. Um, we don't do our uh, dinner any longer that we used to do down there in Richmond, but uh, that was also an opportunity uh, on more than one occasion to connect with uh, legislators when they were in session. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you. 
Good evening, board members, Dr. Murphy. I'm glad to be here tonight to talk about the 2018 session of the Virginia General Assembly. It's going to be very exciting, and I always tell you that when I come. I say it's going to be a very exciting year, but there's two major things that are going to happen this year to make it even more exciting. And part of it is the fact that, um, as you know, the election went really well for those of us who are interested in education. We may have new people on the education committees. If it turned out that we might have 50-50, we might even have a new chair of the education committee in the House. So that's certainly going to be very different. We've got a lot of new people, and most of them are very interested in education. And hopefully, we'll get them on the education committee and get things moving along. The other thing, and this is one that you probably are not really aware of, but for those of us who go down to Richmond, um, the General Assembly building, where everybody has done their business for many years, is now closed. It is being renovated, and it's going to be three or four years. And so all of the General Assembly business is moving into what the, the name of it is the Pocahontas building, which is on the other side of the Capitol. A uh, much smaller building. Um, they're asking people not to come to Richmond in large groups uh, to do lobbying. And so how all that will settle out is also going to be, I think, a, a challenge. There's not an awful lot different in our legislative package this year, but things that I did want to call to your attention. First, the introduction, and we've had that for a long time, but there's a specific thing in that introduction I wanted to point out to you, and that is talking about local control and local flexibility, and especially talking about that for student discipline. As you're all aware, student discipline was a big issue during this last uh, session of the General Assembly in terms of who could be suspended, how long they could be suspended. Um, we did not get into any of that because our, our position has always been that it is a local issue and the locality should be the ones who make those kinds of decisions. So I wanted to point that out to you. Um, we have a new funding uh, position this year and that is something called the at-risk add-on. And this is a funding method that is used for students who are in poverty, second language students. And so uh, that ha um, there hasn't been any change in the formula for a number of years. And so we're looking at having some change. Uh, and this would um, impact every school division. There's no school division in, in uh, Virginia that doesn't have kids who are at risk. And so this would be a win-win, so we'd be not, not fighting one school division against the other. Back to mandates. And as you know, last year, uh, along with Senator Barbara Favola, we had a initiative about a school health advisory board. Uh, over the past four or five years, uh, one of the big issues that we've had to deal with is people coming in with more and more things about student health that the schools should be doing. And most of them are things somebody should be doing. And one of the things that happens with this is nobody takes a real look at it and says, is this something that is realistic for the school divisions to do? And I'll give you an example of something that might happen in this next year. As you probably have read, in the state of Maryland, everybody has to, every school has to have the Narcon kits, regardless of whether you're in elementary school, middle school, high school. When they did this in Montgomery County, uh, people there said, we've never had a drug overdose in any of our schools where we needed to have this Narcon kit. This would be the kind of thing that could go to the School Health Advisory Board who might say something like this, and I don't know how it would play out, but look at it and say, yes, we think that this is something that needs to be done, but it doesn't need to be done in every school, maybe just high schools. And so before this, we really have not had people which health professionals, education professionals, who were looking at these things holistically and saying, are these things that school divisions should be doing? 
Senator Favola has worked very hard on this, and uh, she has gotten it, th uh, even though it did not pass the Senate in the last session, she did get it to go to the Future Public Education Commission, and they have um, recommended it. So I would think that this is probably something that might happen this year. Um, another new position, and this is one that I don't know whether we're really going to need this position, but as of today, we don't know, and that is high school graduation requirements. The standards of accreditation will be going to the state board on Thursday for their approval. And if the state board then approves it, it has to go through the Administrative Process Act. However, the governor has said that as soon as the state board approves it, that he's going to, um, he's going to sign it and that it can go into effect for the 2018 school year. And so if all that works, well, that's really great. But if it turns out that something happens in the meanwhile, it doesn't get signed off, there is other things that need to, to go on, then put this in here so that, um, you know, if things are still vague as far as the, the requirements, that schools would then not have to do it until start uh, kids who are sophomores in 2019. Hopefully, we'll be able to take this out of here on when, uh, when we meet uh, about the, the positions in December. But felt like we needed it just in case. There is nothing else here that is new. Uh, of course, we're going to uh, support return and control of public school calendar to local school boards now that Fairfax County uh, is starting school before Labor Day. The three inner Northern Virginia school divisions, Arlington, Alexandria, and Falls Church, are the only ones who have to start school after Labor Day. And uh, of course, you've got a bunch in, in uh, the Richmond area and down in Tidewater. But many, many more school divisions um, can start school before Labor Day than can't start school. So that's about it. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Elliott, do we have any speakers? Okay, board colleagues, questions or comments? No? Mr. Goldstein. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Lilith. Um, can you uh, kind of educate us on um, the purpose of um, recommendations from our level to the General Assembly? I mean, what... Um, we do a lot of things here. We have our own set of policies, mm -hmm. and I guess I'm not really clear on how they uh, dovetail with or are separate from that kind of policy making at the general assembly level. So, you know, we we have policies. We do things here that we don't find really at the general assembly level. Can you can you help me here? Well, the big place that you're going to find all of this is the standards of accreditation. And the State Board has been working on that for a year, year and a half. Uh, it's 188 pages long, and those are the regulations, will be the regulations that affect all school divisions. So that's the umbrella under which we work. So when we certainly don't do any policies that are opposed to what would be in the standards of accreditation. Is that? Uh, yeah, so that would relate to uh, instruction, instruction oh, yes. or achievement. Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking particularly of, you know, we have policies related to protection of students, student rights, I'm thinking particularly transgender, uh, that I, I believe do not exist at the General Assembly level. Nevertheless, we have them. That's right. And we are enabled to have them. Mm -hmm. And so should we be pursuing uh, recommendations at the General Assembly level that are consistent with our local policies? Or does it not matter because we have the power to, to do what we want anyway? Or it, it doesn't matter. Um, and the other part about it is that 
a lot of things that we have as policies and that we would do are not things that would necessarily be all that popular with the rest, rest of the Commonwealth. And so some of it is we don't even want to open those Pandora boxes and say, well, we're already doing this and you all should do it, and then they come up with something that says nobody can do it. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Probably happened. <laughs> um, another example, in, in fact, uh, that, that I know we've uh, been discussing a bit is the, are the issues about student discipline. Right. And I think this is an example of, of Mr. Gold, what Mr. Goldstein is asking about as well. Um, there were a number of bills last year about restricting the length of time that students can be suspended and mm -hmm. different things like that. And when we looked at these bills, we, we thought, well, they look fine for us. We don't suspend kids for several months anyway. We have, um, uh, you know, we're, we're very careful about that. Um, and in fact, but, but, but our association, the Virginia School Board Association, the SBA, um, was against those bills because uh -huh. That would be putting mandates on on others on, on school systems that might want to have those long-term yes. suspensions. Yeah. We don't do it, but um, and 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 we're not choosing to weigh in on that and say we're against those bills in our package because we're able uh -huh. to set our own rules and we don't want to. While we have opinions about what other school districts are doing, we don't want to. Uh -huh. Yes, there's tell them. There's a number of issues that I am very silent on when I'm there and talk to our legislators because our, we've got the most wonderful group of legislators because they, are, they know our schools, they know what we're doing, they're happy about it. Um, none of them, however, are, are in education committees or uh, appropriations. So we really don't have that kind of, of conduit into to what's going on. But uh, some of these things, you know, for example, they might come and say, Lilla, how do you feel about this uh, bill about, and as you were saying, um, you know, limiting the number of days that you can su uh, suspend uh, K kids K through three. And I'm like, well, uh, we don't do that. <laughs> you know, so it's not necessarily something that, uh, and people were very, I mean, th those bills didn't get through and they were, you know, the, probably the most contentious education issue this year. And they were bills that came, you know, almost like 49, you know, uh, 51 kinds of things. They weren't things that were at all uh, close. So, I mean, uh, out. yeah. Right, um, and in fact, uh, yes, Ms. Talento. Oh, shall I finish? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I was going to say, um, and that is why, in fact, we had been putting in our, our general support for the VSBA's mm -hmm. legislative package, yeah. and in fact, it's because of their support, right. uh, their um, being against those mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, bills in the past, and yes. I think they're still including that kind of language that, oh, that sure. we're choosing not to yeah. support, um, although we are, of course, all members of the VSBA, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not explicitly putting in yeah. our in our package. Um, I just wanted to point out, I, I always call out the calendar issue every year. It's something we would love to have flexibility on. King's Dominion closed early this year. Three, three days, <laughs> yes. So they don't even want to stay open through Labor no. Day. So, you know, that would be really nice if we could finally get some, um, some, I, I don't know. I don't know why it is. I don't know that they said, but um, that'd be nice to, to get that flexibility. I know that's always considered a long shot. Mm -hmm. And I certainly hope we don't have book banning bills coming up this year, as, as, as we did last year. So, no, I hope or, or not. book, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Talento? I just wanted to uh, point out that this is why in the introduction it's so important that we support and advocate for um, local school boards to have the flexibility yeah. to determine policies. Yeah. Because we, our policies don't necessarily align with the rest of Virginia. and. Going to the VSBA, the one thing that has really stood out for me and what I've learned and what I'd like to share with the community is a lot of Virginia and Southwest Virginia and Southern Virginia, they do not have even close to the resources that oh, Arlington course. County Public Schools have. And what I heard when I spoke to some of, um, some of the school board colleagues in those areas is not so much that they don't support the reduction in discipline, they don't have the resources for the alternative 
programs that we do have in the alternative uh, in the professional development training so there's you know it's just important to understand that we are so lucky here in yes. northern virginia the economy is so amazing the support systems that we have with local government the advocacy it's, it's just such a different type of culture here that it really uh, is important for us to have that flexibility in the local school boards yep. and for some of those um, other counties in Southern Virginia and, and Southwestern Virginia to have their mm -hmm. flexibility right. as they work. Mm -hmm. So I just, I know that a lot, I did, I share that because as a community member, I was not aware of it until I became a school board member and was able to travel and meet colleagues providing public service to their co counties and mm -hmm. trying to determine how to best serve the needs of their students yep. under their circumstances. So, okay. just, and thank you for the work that you do. I really, really appreciate it. Yes, Ms. Van Doren. I happened to have spent the weekend with my family that's full of um, EMTs. And um, between that and the uh, information we've been provided by the police in Arlington about uh, the increase in opioid use, uh -huh. I just have to comment on the Narcan. I, I, I hope that we are talking to our local uh, emergency squads and um, police because it's not just a matter of little kids deciding to do something, it's what's around in the home and the adults. Yep. So in the same way you have EpiPens everywhere, unfortunately I think we're in an era where Narcan is something you have to have everywhere and I, I just couldn't let that go because it's okay. become something very present as I watch, uh -huh. particularly our first responders have to deal with it and yep. if it's something we can, I, I would just ask that before we say, well our little kids aren't doing that, well, it's not just about the little kids. Just ask the local officials if they think it would be a good idea for schools to have that in the nurse's office. So. Well, I, I think my point was that high schools probably need that. But do you need to be spending the money for this for elementary schools and middle schools? But I don't want to be the one who's going to make that kind of decision. That's the kind of issue that I hope that this uh, school health advisory board will be able to do. And, and I'm just asking to get data from the local area in approaching those things, particularly when it relates to what we need to do in the schools. Yep. Okay. To clarify that, the, the, the legislation we're supporting um, would establish a school health advisory board. That's all. Who, and that's exactly what they would do. So, so that's the whole point, is we wouldn't be having this discussion, no. and we would be, ref and nor would our legislators without consulting this expert body. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what's really valuable about it. We certainly yeah. hope that that can happen. Um, mm -hmm. Any other, um, one last note. Um, last year, we, 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 we thought we would just sort of get started thinking about the fact that um, we had been, the school board was restricted in our salary. Mm -hmm. And we asked you to get started seeing whether we could open that up Yep. And, you know, boom, you just did it within, in one session. We, we were thinking, you know, we got to build this up so that in 2020 we could perhaps consider, and I'm not saying we're going to do it, no. but we could consider a, a raise for the school board because we don't get paid very much. Um, and and so anyway, we planted that, um, you know, with you, and, and you just did it in, in one session and got that done, and we didn't get a chance to publicly thank you for that. So that was well, really great work. Delegate Hope is the one to really thank for that. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Comment, Mr. Goldstein? I was just wondering if you had any more crowd pleaser items to, uh, to talk about. I, I, that's a good one. <laughs> we do, everything's transparent here. Everything's transparent. Yeah. We want to make sure people know how things happen. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. We're looking forward to working with yeah. you this session. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we, yeah, we, I, I, yeah, to be clear, Arlington Public County Public School School Board had a restriction on what we could get paid, whereas other districts did not. Um, we are ready for our next information item, and it is on middle and high school, our middle and high school program of studies. Dr. Murphy. Yes, so let me turn to uh, Dr. Natras again and members of her team. I uh, see Mr. Bird moving into position. Uh, we do this uh, annually where we bring to you updates uh, regarding the program of studies. 
sometimes we have recommendations to eliminate um, particular courses and then uh, add additional courses. This is an all preparation for students as they prepare after we come back after the first of the year, begin to register for classes for the coming school year. So we try and have a constant stream of updating and revising and that's what you're going to hear about this evening. Uh, this is an information item and we'll be coming back for action at the next meeting. Yes, and as we get started, I am going to um, ask Mr. Bird to come up and talk a little bit about our process and some of the themes of the recommendations that we're making. I do also want to clarify that we have a program of studies for this current school year that should actually read 2018-19. We're making the decision um, for next year. We have one in place this year, so the date on that is actually incorrect. So just so we all know, um, we do have that. So I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Bird, who is going to speak through our process and how we look at the courses and then um, we'll answer any questions that you may have about specific courses or anything else. So, Ty. Thank you, Dr. Natris. Good evening, everyone, again. Uh, before I do, if you would indulge me one moment, though. Um, Lilla is here. Lilla? Hi. I'm sorry to interrupt. You don't have to stand up, but I just wanted to say thank you to her as well um, on a personal level. Um, I was an assistant principal at Washington Lee High School. I had applied for several principal's jobs across the county and had no success. Um, I don't know how she came across my name, but she did, and she invited me to lunch in Falls Church City, and we had a conversation for about an hour and a half. She gave an hour and a half of her Saturday to me, and when that meeting was over, I felt like I could be a principal. Um, I didn't get the next job, but I got the next one. And, and Lilla, thank you for giving me the confidence to continue to compete for positions. I don't know how you got my name, but I'm so glad you did. And thank you. <laughs> so we'll let her go. So, yeah, look at me now, right? Yeah. All right. Medium-sized jock. All right. Um, so the program of studies. It's a vitally important document for our entire community. Uh, it informs our students and our family members of the course offerings that are available to them in post-secondary, um, excuse me, in middle school and in high school. And it also informs post-secondary institutions of the course offerings that we have. As we engage college uh, recruiters and we talk to them about what makes a candidate more attractive than another candidate, uh, the level of rigor that is offered to our to our students is one of the leading contributors to that to that attractive for a school to welcome in a student. So as we consider courses to include in our program of studies, we want to make sure that they inspire our students to, to be excellent, uh, engages them in the learning, challenges them at the highest level that they're ready to accept with the levels of support that we're willing to offer them uh, or that we're able to offer them and it's rel it relates to them in their lives and it also aligns so that we start we can pro provide students in middle school a challenge that we can build upon as they matriculate through high school. Oops. Uh, our process uh, it begins at the school level most often uh, we have the, the great fortune in Arlington County to have some very creative uh, and thoughtful educators in the classroom uh, and to continually uh, ask them to come up with courses that are going to inspire and and challenge and engage our students they come up with ideas that they share with leadership in their buildings uh, then that spills over to the Department of Teaching and Learning, either through a coach of that class or that specific educator reaching out to somebody in the Department of Teaching and Learning. So our course, course our um, curriculum supervisors uh, make determinations of which of those proposals should be considered. Those proposals might include an addition to, to our program of studies. It might include a revision of, a, of an existing class, or it might include a deletion, something that we may not want to continue offering for one reason or another. Uh, so it goes to the Department of Learning, and then it visits, we visit with our, uh, it's not on this slide, but our, our docs or our directors of counseling services and also our middle and high school principals also get an opportunity to chime in. We've used utilized technology to help streamline that process through Google Docs uh, and we ask our principals, our docs, and our assistant principals to, to, to view the offerings, the things that are going to be changed or amended, things that are going to be added and things that might be deleted from a program of study. And then the last step is to visit with you, the school board, to ask for your ideas with regard to the things we offer and the things that we may no longer offer. So the themes from the 1819 um, program of study, uh, the additions. We're, we're hopeful of continually, 
continuing to include in students in Arlington Tech. So we're going to have to make certain that we have the courses that they need to matriculate through high school in pursuit of either a, a standard or an advanced studies diploma. So we have to make sure that they have all the courses that they need to do that. The, the Wakefield AP Capstone experience is a theme of our new uh, program of studies, as well as CTE course sequencing to make sure that uh, students who have taken level one of something can take level two or, or, or level three, as the case might be. Uh, and then also support for our English language learners and students with disabilities. We wanted to make sure that those students are continuing, we're, we're continuing to consider their needs as we offer new courses in our program of studies. And then those courses that are deleted were deleted um, because the enrollment has been so low over the last several years. Uh, the rationale for our revisions, again, we want to be aligned with the Virginia Department of Education to make sure that all of our students can compete for the diploma of their choosing, whether that be a standard diploma or an advanced studies diploma. Uh, it has to align with the school board's strategic plan, which is under development now, but we are still going to make sure that we have, we have met the needs of, of the school board and our community. Uh, Student interest and needs, we listen to our students and try to, and, and that begins as a grassroots movement at the schools when a teacher uh, often pro pro uh, proposes a, a course to us, it is often because a student has requested that, or several students have requested that we consider offering those courses. And then we also want to make certain that they adhere to evidence-based best practices in the classroom. Uh, and as we continue to develop the five C's, which uh, the Virginia Department of Education is considering for the new uh, profile of a high school graduate, critical thinking skills, creative thinking skills, collaboration, communication, and citizenship, we want to make sure that we are enhancing the five C's throughout all that we do in the classroom. Okay. Any questions? Excellent. Um, well, let's check first. Ms. Elliott, do we have any speakers? Yes, ma'am, we do. We have two speakers tonight. The wrong one, though. First is Ellen Mag. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Wow, we've made it. I was thinking this board meeting was going to last longer than my recent Marine Corps marathon. Um, so thank you, Dr. Murphy, school board members, Ms. O'Grady. My name is Elaine Mag, and I am the co-chair of Gifted Services Advisory Committee. I'm also the parent of children at Glebe and Swanson. Some of you have even met my son, Connor. I'm here tonight to ask you to amend the middle school program of studies to include intensified classes in all core subjects, which would provide optimal learning environments for advanced learners. My children have been exposed to a set of great teachers in APS. Almost to a person, they appear to be qualified to provide daily challenges across their diverse set of subjects, but when the rubber meets the road, differentiation fails. No amount of desire on the teacher's part can create enough time to meet the needs of advanced learners on a daily or sometimes even weekly basis when in the midst of the broad student groupings APS uses. Multiple differentiation strategies have been tried. They come as a patchwork delivered unevenly as time allows. That's not fair to my child who is expected to come to school ready to learn every day. Challenge him daily with intensified classes. We support advanced students in band, in choir, and foreign language, but as academics, we ignore them. Your job is to provide my child a year of progress each year. Do it with intensified classes. Intensified classes in all core subjects would allow any student who wishes to opt in for a year of in-depth exploration. Did Hamilton inspire a love of early US history? Then go intensified in sixth grade and drop back to regular in seventh. Maybe explore life science in depth in seventh grade. In many ways, it's easy to avoid tracking in non-math core subjects because the classes don't necessarily build from one year to the next. Multiple faculty members agree that intensified classes will help them meet the needs of all their students. The school board should mandate that the program of studies, studies include intensified classes in all core subjects following the recommendations of Dr. Joyce Van Tassel Baska and the gifted committee. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dan Corcoran. Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Murphy, my name is Dan Corcoran. I'm the Gifted Services Advisory Committee co-chair and the parent of an eighth grader at Williamsburg. I'm here tonight to urge you to not accept the middle school program, program of studies as delivered by the Department of Teaching and Learning. Over the last month, I've met with Dr. Natras and many of you to look at the survey results from the Gifted Services Program Evaluation. The middle school teacher survey results show unequivocally that differentiation for gifted students is not being delivered. Only 9% of core content teachers reported they use curriculum for the gifted daily. 65% of teachers with identified gifted students use curriculum for the gifted only once per month or less. I do not fault the teachers. 
I have talked with APS teachers about differentiation, and I believe they truly care and are doing the best they can for our students. These teachers tell me they cannot effectively differentiate for the gifted under the current system. Student survey responses confirm what teachers report. In middle school, only 6% of gifted responders strongly agreed they were challenged in their non-intensified core classes. Intensified classes provide stark contrast. In math, the only intensified core class available to middle school students, 94% of gifted middle schoolers agree or strongly agree that intensified classes challenge them. GSAC has recommended the implementation of intensified classes in middle school since 2011. Last year, ACI ranked that continuous recommendation fifth, clearly a high priority. Dr. Joyce Van Tassel Baska, the APS consultant hired for the gifted program evaluation, also recommended that APS implement intensified classes in middle school. Support for the currently proposed program of studies disregards the needs of our gifted students and ignores the input of teachers, parents, and experts in the field of gifted education. Please deliberately consider the needs of the gifted and modify the middle school program of studies and include intensified classes for all core subjects. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for your patience in uh, enduring this meeting. Um, board colleagues, questions, comments? Ms. Talento? Um, I looked at the uh, recommended updates and uh, it was exciting to see some of the additions that you guys are bringing forward um, at the middle school level. I have spoken to parents about um, the intensified piece at the middle school level and I understand the concerns about tracking and I just wonder if there's a middle ground to explore a compromise per se, where we provide a class that is a specialty class that may challenge someone in a subject that they like. For instance, in sixth grade reading, if we had a class that was, you know, reading around the world, where sixth graders would read books from different places in the world that were at their level, so a person who was gifted could really challenge themselves and then a child who loves to read and has no clue that they're gifted but truly are because I think we do miss some of our students you know something is there a way to be creative about it I know that we're working on differentiation and that differentiation is something that we are new and I don't know if we have enough information to determine if it's successful at this time so I'm not taking away from that I'm just wondering if there's a way to find a place where we can meet the needs while we grow and train our teachers and strengthen the program. So I don't need an answer this evening, but I wanted to provide that feedback um, because I have heard concerns from the community that it's excellent at, in high school, it's excellent at the elementary level, we are still struggling at the middle school level. Mm -hmm. um, and I just am trying to find out if there's a way where we can help these students that are in the gap of while we are improve and perfect our system so uh, that's one and then I did have a question about um, some of the additions and this might be provided in other material that that or when the program studies come about is there a way to see for instance I noticed that we're adding um, steam courses at Kenmore for the steam program that they have there and I think there was one course that came in Jefferson is there any way to see what schools have it and which ones don't. Will that come out in the draft program of studies before it's approved? I'm just curious, is there a way to determine how we're providing that across the schools or what the specific reason may be why we're adding it in one place and not in another? Sure. Um, so let's first address the gifted services at middle school, right? Because this is a conversation that we've had um, several times. The first piece to that is we want all of our students to be challenged and engaged. And we've had conversation and that is the goal, right? right? Every student should go home and say, these are the amazing things I learned today and I'm really being pushed and this is what I have to, we want that for all of our students, right? In all of their courses. And so that's the first piece. I think that goal is the same across the board as we've worked with the gifted advisory committee. We've looked at program evaluations and other things. Um, one of the pieces that I think we have really strengthened this year are the cluster groups within our middle schools and we said last spring when we came and talked about gifted that we would be monitoring that throughout the summer our principals and our directors of counseling hand scheduled a lot of students to get them into 
those cluster grouping classes so that then, um, as you referenced, we can provide the specific professional learning and also really work with the teachers to ensure that the students are being challenged because that is our goal. The third piece to that is the conversation that we're having around intensified classes can sometimes lead to tracking. What I think we also all have common ground on is the open enrollment would lessen that in some of the courses, right? So it's not a continue on this ELA track in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I think that can also be a challenge in that how do we make sure that that actually doesn't happen? Um, and so part of what we're looking at, and I think we had talked about this a little bit at the literacy work session earlier this year, is that we are updating all of our curriculum documents where we're looking at what are the courses that we're offering and then also what are we doing within those courses? And if you look at the ELA curriculum docu documents, you'll actually see where we are embedding resources for teachers to provide enrichment opportunities for students so they don't have to go to a separate website or they don't have to go try to find things to challenge students. One of the hardest things to this that cluster grouping will also address is it is very challenging, and our speakers this evening spoke to that, in a 42-minute block of time when you have a range of students to make sure that that is actually happening. So as we're also looking at our curriculum, we're trying to make the resources more readily available. We are also looking at courses to see do we expand for some of those more in-depth ideas? Um, I think you referenced like reading around the world or something, but international literature and what does that look like in each of the courses that could be open enrollment? So as we do the curriculum work for each of the content areas, we can look to see can we create a course or two that would allow for that across content areas. Um, so those are the big pieces. I think we just have to be mindful of some of the issues that can also come from that. And then the second question was about Kenmore and STEAM, right? right. I was just curious. I, I know, for instance, at the high school level, Wakefield offers programs that, because of their AP Capstone project that Washington Lee does, and Washington Lee has programs because of the IB program that Yorktown does. Yorktown has different yes. AP classes because of the, you know, and they're all amazing schools, and each student has different opportunities at each school, and I know that plays itself out in middle school as well, but I was just, I don't know middle school the way I don't know high school, and I was wondering if there's, um, where we will see that, and if there are reasons why, uh, what the reasons are for some classes, so mm -hmm. that as a school board member, when I go to the community and they say, well, why doesn't this class exist in this middle school, I can say, it pertains to this program, but your school has X mm -hmm. class, you know what I mean? Just the same mm -hmm. way I yes. can advocate for all of our high schools, I would like the opportunity to have that at the middle school level, and seeing the uh, uh, programs that we're the new classes that we're providing that would be helpful to me. And in the cases that are here for Kenmore, these are specific to the focus that Kenmore has on technology and the arts, and they're really working to have a solid 6-8 trajectory where courses build off of one another and students are getting credentials in um, various areas, and these courses allow for that. So if you look at the one um, for STEAM applications, it's a continuation from the STEAM Foundations course. So students could do STEAM Foundations in sixth grade and then move into STEAM applications in seventh and that is specific to Ken Moore's area of focus sure okay Ms. Van Dorn okay I'm on the same theme of cons of consistency um, mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the same issue that uh, Ms. Lento raised but from a different perspective I think we should be consistent across the schools so for example, you have African-American studies or history at Wakefield. Will that be offered at Yorktown and Washington Lee as well? I would suggest that it should be. Um, I've heard that frequently about the GIS course taught at Washington Lee, that it's not taught at the other schools. I really would like us to strive for consistency because if all of our schools are wonderful and all kids can benefit from each of the schools, then we should make that happen. So it was hard for me to read that list and know, are they filling in for something that doesn't exist somewhere already, mm -hmm. or where is it? And I, I, w I think there should be, uh, having four kids and having compared those programs of studies from different schools, it has always been concerning to me that they are, there's some great classes that should be at all the schools. Mm -hmm. So I would also like to see I was suggested this afternoon that I just go on and look at the program of studies for each of the schools. I think 
there should be an easier way to go about yeah. doing that. We could, I was just looking at this and I think we could code it in some way. So the way we have the table for you now, we could add a column that says this is, you know, to have at all schools, right? So we need to add it to this school because it's already at the other two comprehensive. So we'll add a column and that, we'll put that, that would, in. That would so be, you know that would be helpful, but I would have a goal perfect. of That's offering, That's yep. unless it's really germane to a specific mm -hmm. thing at a specific school, which I right. don't think our schools that mm -hmm. different, maybe IB, but no. I think we should strive for that mm -hmm. or something similar. Because right. uh, I do hear that a lot, mm -hmm. that people want sure. those opportunities at all the schools. And I think we have enough students at each school now that we can offer a good solid array of, of offerings mm -hmm. across the schools. Um, uh, my next question is about the middle school level and um, sign language. I see that's only at Jefferson. Uh, I really do hope that's going to go to all the middle schools in the same way that we are offering other foreign languages beginning at the middle school level. I see it's, I'm thrilled to see it there, but I have a feeling that you're piloting it there. I'll let um, Ty speak to that because he was just answering it in my ear. Yeah, it, it is only there now for middle school um, and it, as a pilot. Yeah, it's, it's an offering for IB so that we can give students an opportunity to have six years of a language. Uh, so it needs to start there. It's also a special education consideration. Uh, students who have processing issues and have difficulty with some of the other languages are, are, are better prepared for sign language as a language. Now that the Virginia Department of Education accepts it as a foreign language or a, a world language, um, it can be used for an advanced diploma. Okay, there are kids across the school system Certainly. who are students uh, with uh, special needs not just at Jefferson. Understood. Uh, there are students who pursue an IB diploma that don't just come from Jefferson, they come from all the schools. And we had to push in the disability community very, very hard to get sign language at the high school level, and now we are overwhelmed with the enrollment. I am certain that if you offer that at all the middle schools, you will be overwhelmed with the enrollment. It, it's, it's, it's in huge demand. So I would really rather not just be at one school. I, I would challenge you to consider expanding that at more than one middle school, if not all of them, at least the first level class. Okay. I, I, would, I understand the reason for Jefferson because you have your um, kids moving up from um, Henry into Jefferson, but the demand is there. The demand is definitely there. I would also really like to see that offered at Arlington Tech. Um, it, it, having that a foreign language class is a gateway to the advanced diploma. Mm -hmm. And if you're only offering Spanish Arlington Tech, and I know that we're doing that, I think you are precluding, am I wrong? Do you have another language at Arlington Tech? We are beginning to add other world languages to I'm Arlington asking you to Tech please. Because, yep, we are. Be because the ability for us, many, many students with disabilities have a much easier time with sign language mm -hmm. than the other uh, courses. Okay. So I'm asking you to go full bore on sign language mm -hmm. at middle school forward at every single secondary school. Uh, we, the demand will be there. You're just going to have to find the teachers, and we have great connections to the various um, schools uh, for the deaf and hard and hearing that we should be able to. I'm just really going to push on that because I, I read about that a lot on the various disability listservs about my child can't go here or there because they don't have sign language, the, the sign language classes. So I really, really would like us to address that. And then, um, so those are two, and I would, we are going to have a way to look at the various courses um, across the board uh, sure. at all the, we can add a column to the program of sure. studies because mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard to figure this out given what we were provided, sure. that short list. Um, I want to touch on clustering and uh, the gifted students. I feel very old, but I hearken back to the days when there were intensified classes at the middle school level. And while I understand the community is asking for that, there are negative consequences to that. And it goes back to those secret knowledge questions that people in the Arlington community have. That if you just know what class to ask for, that's the class you want your kid to get into, and that's the class that fills up for the gifted kids. And there was benefit to having uh, that competitive nature of applying for those classes be, well, the, to have the students distributed and, and have the goal being 
to improve outcomes and improve what was being delivered in all the classes. So I would, I love the goal of improving what we do in every class at the middle school level um, in terms of rigor and pushing students. And I have, with four kids, I have seen those classes where teachers do differentiate based on the needs of the students from across the, the, the uh, spectrum. And I would love for us to take those teachers that really do that very, very well and use them as role models for other teachers and maybe be master teachers that teach the other teachers in their school to do that because there are teachers right now who do that extremely well. And why that can't catch on, I, I, I think I would challenge us to do that. Um, and I'm thinking, I've mentioned to Dr. Murphy um, several times that one of the programs that I put into place as a quality program was really a kind of a recognition on a regular basis of those teachers that are doing exactly what you want them to be doing ex so that they, that kind of role model can go from just their one classroom to the other classrooms in their school to the other classrooms across the county because there may be a technique that someone's using and doing every single day that then could be modeled other places. And I don't think we do enough of that sharing as a way to uh, disseminate and improve the rigor of the instruction at the middle school level. And I'm really focused on middle school because I think mm -hmm. that's where we're, it's our Achilles heel right now. But I, I really think that there are some great, great teachers who are doing that. And we just have to get that knowledge out. So I would encourage us to model it and challenge ourselves and find those master teachers and let them teach the other other um, teachers on that topic. Thank you. Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. I, um, I was looking over that high school program of studies and my eye fell on the same one that Nancy's did about African American studies at Wakefield. And I didn't quite hear the answer. Are we adding that only at Wakefield or are we adding it at Wakefield because it's the lone hole in the, the comprehensive high schools that doesn't have it now. So my response was we're actually gonna do that for all of the courses so you can see where we're filling holes and where it may be a new one. That particular course actually came out of a request from the students and the teachers at Wakefield not from the other schools, that's why Wakefield is listed. So that's something that we're gonna to have to think about as we go through our process for the program of studies because we have allowed schools to say, here's a course that we're interested in, that our students are interested in, and go ahead and pilot it or put it into the program of studies for that school, build the curriculum, try it out, you know, use it because they are early adopters of it, and then add it to other schools. So if the board direction is, we really want to have the same courses at every school, we're gonna have to think about how we then get the information from students at teachers at schools who are very passionate about something or who want that um, for their school community, and before we put it into the program of study C, do we want that across all of our schools? And if we do and we can and we can staff it and get the curriculum and things written, then we can put it in for all three schools. We're just gonna have to be willing to then say, thank you, that's a fantastic idea. We can't staff it at all three schools, so therefore we can't offer it right now. That's the balance that we're gonna have to look at if we decide to say, every course has to be offered at all three schools. Because part of our process has been, here's what students and teachers at that school are really interested in having and then we just have to add another step to see if we would be able to implement that at all three schools. So I understand that um, using the example of sign language it may be or or any world language it may be difficult to find the dual endorsed teachers or the endorsed teachers to do that but um, I'm quoting from the program of studies uh, about the African-American studies. Students will gain an appreciation of the richness, diversity, and contributions of African-American culture to national and international life in the world. Will reaffirm the fact that if civilization in the United States is not the result of the work and energy of one people, but is the result of the contributions of African-Americans and many other groups, and will develop a knowledge of important people, events, and ideas that have played a key role in shaping the history and culture of African Americans and the history and culture of the United States. 
it's hard for me to imagine that that wouldn't be a value in every secondary school. And it's also hard for me to imagine that we wouldn't be able to find a duly certified teacher who could teach that. I agree. So my follow-up question is, are we going to wait until there's a request from the other two comprehensive high schools or any of the rest of the high schools to teach, to install a similar course? So I agree with you, particularly with this course. What we're saying is we're going to step outside of the process that we have historically used for the program of studies. What has happened with courses like this prior to now is that we would have a teacher or a group of students or someone propose a course that a high school wants to implement. Then Wakefield would implement this course for a year. And if it's successful, the curriculum's written and things have gone well, then we typically add it. That's what you sometimes see in the program of studies. So. This particular course, we have not necessarily evaluated from the lens of, would we implement this at all three schools? There isn't a reason necessarily not to. What this came from was an idea from a school that we wanted to say, yes, that's a fantastic idea. Let's implement that, and then let's see if that's something that we want to expand across the board. So we can, through the process that we shared, start looking at all of the courses that come from schools like that and say, should we be implementing that across all three schools? Yes, um, because consistency is something that we have talked about as a system. We just then have to be willing to say, as we're looking at those, then, well, maybe we can't do that now because we can't do it at X other buildings. But this is a great example of one that, sure, it, we would have the teachers and we could implement and write the curriculum this summer to have it. That may not be the case with every course that comes through. And that's simply just not been the process, but we can always modify that. You can. Sure, we can. Will, yes. you, will you? Sure. I mean, there's okay. no... How long will it take? So, I, I was wondering if I could you... jump in here for just a second. I, I have to sort of caution the board on uh, uh, broadly, okay? Let's subtract this particular course. I'm not, I'm not addressing the course nor the content. And we've had discussions uh, among ourselves and publicly about how fast we're moving, okay? And I really need to caution all of us in regards to this. The practices that we have in place are something that Arlington Public Schools have had for a time, and the practices also parallel my experience in other school divisions with bringing courses forward. We want to say to people, we want your innovation, we want your ingenuity, we want your creativity, we want to give you the, those opportunities to demonstrate that. This is a perfect example of that. This has come from the school that is interested in doing that. <clears throat> so therefore, I say not to put pressure on other schools with courses like this. Let's give this course a run at that school. Let's have them develop the, the curriculum. Let's have them work out all the kinks so now we don't put two additional stressors on two other high schools that now they have to implement and develop this course. And we don't even know, by the way, if there's students who are interested in taking this course. That's still a question mark. I would assume there would be, but that's something that's out there. So I, I understand sitting here kind of absorbing this initially this evening. Uh, the board's advocacy for that, but, but I, I have to say, I, I approach this with caution. Let the staff flesh this out a little bit more, but for these things to evolve and to catch, and I'll go back to um, the discussion that Ms. Van Dorn had about the sign language, that took us a great deal of time. There was strong advocacy, and that was position driven. In other words, we had to do a heavy recruiting job to build a cadre. That's not to say it's not possible at the middle school level, but I also recognize that now we are sort of increasing, doubling the fold of the number of teachers that we need, and they are high demand. So um, I say, let's have the staff go back. I think this course is a great course. There are tremendous courses out there. But what we've done in the past is we've piloted a lot of these courses, and I caution us to put more stressors on top of people that are going 100 miles an hour 
And I, I think that this is another example of how we, in our quest to do the best, we create these vacuums for ourselves. And uh, as a consequence, we're getting phone calls in October that's saying, you know what, this particular course is being implemented, and it's being implemented in a way that you know, students aren't learning. So there's the flip side to these equations that I think we have got to bring to the forefront and be very aware of. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the, um, the point. The point is well taken. And I was um, afraid I'm not making myself clear in that I am not asking for this course to be implemented tomorrow or next week or this year or next year. I'm simply asking how long do you think it's going to take? Can I see a timeline? Maybe it'll take a year. Maybe in your example of um, uh, sign language, it takes several years. I, fine. I, I would just like to know what to look forward to. Let me put it in a different way. When should I ask again about the progress? And what I'll, what I'll ask staff to do is let's bring back what I, I'll call a generic timeline about how we could bring forward or how these things evolve. I know there are several examples out there that we've seen that have kind of played out um, in past, uh, you know, course history. So we can bring that as a sort of a, a format for how these things evolve. Um, and I, I think the one thing that I don't want to sort of uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater is we want these courses to evolve out of our schools because our staff knows what the students are interested in and it is somewhat student generated. So I think that would be a possibility. You know, I, I hear this along some of the lines you've spoken about before, Mr. Goldstein, around sort of milestones and timelines and how do, how do we know we're getting there? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to move to a different topic, which is gifted services. Um, so my question there, and I know we've had a lot of discussion about this, and will, uh, is how are we delivering gifted services with fidelity at the middle school level? How are we measuring what we're doing? And how do we define success delivering gifted services, specifically at the middle school level? Now, I um, keep hearing about tracking being a bad thing, uh, uh, intensified classes leading to tracking. I, I think there's a leap in logic there that I'm just not understanding. Um, so if you could address that, I'd like to hear it. Sure, so when Ms. Talenta was asking earlier about what we are looking at for intensified classes, one of the things that we have done this year, and we spoke about it last spring with our gifted services um, presentation is that we are cluster grouping our students. So that means that we have five to eight students who have been identified gifted in that area who are being scheduled into the same course so that the teachers who are delivering those services can be provided with the resources they need and the professional learning they need to meet the needs of those cluster groups of students. So that's our gifted service delivery model at the middle schools. We have a gifted resource teacher at each one of the middle schools who can then work with and coach and support the teachers who are delivering that. We also have staff from the Department of Teaching and Learning who are out working with those teachers to help support the differentiation and we've built some of the resources into the curriculum documents that were written for ELA this year and we will continue to do throughout the course of our curriculum review process. So that's the service delivery model. How we know it will be successful are also a couple of the things I spoke to. We want our kids to go home and say that they're excited about school and they're challenged. We don't want them going home and saying, I'm bored, I haven't learned anything this year. So that's kind of the qualitative piece of it. The quantitative piece is our goal that we've written around every student making at least a year's worth of growth. So that applies to students who come in the door and they're on grade level. They also should be making at least a year's worth of growth the same way that we're asking for right any student to have that progress. And so if we have students who are walking in the door and they already know a lot of that content, then it is our job to make sure that they're growing at least a year if that means going beyond what is already at that grade level. Are we delivering that clustering with fidelity we, at all the middle schools? So 
As I spoke to earlier, we tracked that um, scheduling and a lot of our counselors um, hand scheduled students this year and we were able to, and we've provided that data to the gifted advisory committee to show that the majority of our students are cluster grouped at a much higher rate than they have been previously and now we're out really supporting the delivery of services. But we don't, we don't have it for all of the students. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that we have cluster grouped and hand scheduled the students in the middle schools. Those students who may not be in a cluster group, we individually contacted the families and said, we have a choice to make. We've got this band class or we have this cluster group for ELA because sometimes we can't do, right, if there are 13 different puzzle pieces and we only have X amount of periods, but we contacted each of the families and asked, which would you prefer? Would you like to be in Spanish 3 or would you like your child in this ELA intensified course um, and so sometimes there had to be a choice because we couldn't do all of it but for the most part all of the students um, are in a gifted cluster yes and the measurement we're going to use to determine if this is really the right it's working out the right way is actually taking us to the the definition of success is so several things. We've actually talked about using some of the survey questions from the program evaluation that we used last year to get perspective from students on are they being challenged and also from our teachers, do you have the resources and things you need? So we're talking about doing that survey much more often than the program evaluation timeline, which is every seven years. Um, so we've had some conversation about that. And then we are also using the reading inventory data because we can get a year's worth of growth. The challenge with that one is the kids do top out um, at a particular level um, but if you grow 75 lexile points that's about a year's worth of growth so we can use that data particularly in ELA to measure growth uh, um, so all right two more things I um, would like to stay here and talk about this for a couple more hours but um, Focus on the program I of think studies program of studies focus maybe my uh, colleagues might not focus so better. I would like to request that we schedule this topic for a, a work session. Um, yes, the gifted services, um, so that we don't uh, actually stay here until you know the wee hours talking about it. And my last question is going back to what I said before. Um, I, I really don't understand the what I call a leap from intensified classes to the notion of tracking. So could you elaborate on that, why you believe that that's, that's so, you know, the necessary evil, the necessary consequence of having intensified classes? Historically, when you look at how students are assigned to courses where schools have various levels of courses, so courses for students who are on grade level, students who are above grade level, um, students who maybe need additional support, what has traditionally happened in schools is that students when they enter into middle school we say well this child has not and when I say we I'm talking collectively as educators not necessarily in APS because the tracking research right is from across the country that students who maybe did not pass an SOL are placed in a reading course where they need additional support once they're in that course for sixth grade if they don't make at least the year's worth of growth and their schedule is built for the next year what may happen is that child is in that reading class maybe a remedial reading class that they start in in sixth grade and then they end up staying in those remedial classes in sixth seventh and eighth grade same thing for advanced learners so they may end up in this advanced course in sixth grade stay in it in seventh stay in it in eighth and therefore they're being tracked through their school program. And oftentimes there is not a lot of um, movement between those tracks once students are in them. And so what we're really looking at and what I think we do agree on is this open enrollment idea where if we have a particular course, but we have to avoid what Ms. Van Doren said where, okay, well this is where all of the gifted families then know to enroll their child. We have to be mindful of that. We want to prevent that when I come into sixth grade and I'm in a remedial reading class, that then I'm always in remedial reading because it's hard to then make those shifts. And that's 
where tracking um, often becomes an issue. I look forward to taking this up at a work session. All right. Thank you. Um, and just to confirm, we do have um, gifted services at, we have two, I believe, ACI work sessions in the spring. So we will be addressing gifted services then um, at one of those. I don't remember whether it's a recommending or non-recommending year. Um, it's non-recommending. Non-recommending year. Recommendation last year. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, l let me just finish. And we have a very full schedule with budget and CIP work sessions. So whether the board is even able to um, schedule any additional work sessions, we can all discuss as a board and see if that's the direction people want to go. We're, we can't make the decision at this moment. Um, Thank you. Mr. Lander, would you have, my, do you my, have a My question? comment was the question, and I, and I think as we move forward, uh, foundationally, however we explain it, the perception, the consistent feedback that we hear is that the differentiation in the classroom would be for targeted populations or students that are labeled gifted um, has to improve. And then the strategies on how we do that at the secondary level is something I think fundamentally mm -hmm. we should address. And when we talk about meeting the needs of the whole child and each child, I think this is one of the places where um, all of the stuff that we're doing, the perception is still that mm -hmm. there are targeted groups of students, including gifted and talented students, that their needs aren't being met in the classroom. And I think that is what we have to address. And um, I, because I've had this conversation previously, I, I'm familiar with some of the work that's going on and our desire to when students and parents want more work, give them more work and do more, um, uh, provide more access to information and opportunities to learn. But it sounds like the differentiation is what we need to correct. And I think that would help us take a big step forward. So I won't have to sign up for another work session, but I think the conversation is not about gifted and talented services. The conversation is about differentiation and that instructional teacher and learning pieces I think where the board should spend their time because if you just focus on one piece then students with disabilities students all the different targeted populations that we talk about those that is the perception those that's the data that we're looking at to measure so I think as, as Dr. Cannon said we have these work sessions already set up with ACI I think that's the piece that we have to start to dig in and hopefully with um uh and I'm blanking on her name, um, Director of Teaching and Learning. Oh, Sarah Putnam. S Putnam. Maybe she can help the board sort of discuss even two by twos, get them ready for the type of questions and understanding of how this takes place. Because as it was with planning factors, this is a very dense conversation. Ms. Van Dorn. Dr. Murphy, thank you for reminding us that in our quest to do the best, we need to make sure to be realistic. And I wanted to thank you because I, I actually love the fact that the schools bring forward courses that they believe appeal to the students and that address growing needs. And so I really, really do appreciate I wasn't, I wanted to say as you were talking to and replying to uh, Mr. Goldstein that you kind of went from do that to do it for everybody. Uh, it reminds me of being in Back to the Future, where he goes really fast. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to imply that. I just would like to see us, if it works in one place, that we go ahead and consider in the appropriate time frame moving it forward. And I was just. I did find a, uh, the most recent <coughs> program of studies, and uh, uh, for example, the GIS class. Mm -hmm. It is a James Madison class. Um, that's been around for a while now. So, and I know that there's a. A, a hue and cry for that at other schools. So I, I just point that out that if we could have some routine mechanism for, if it works, foster it, go, go teachers, bring them forward, but then if they might be replicated, if we could consider that, it would be great. And I will just put a little push on the, um, the um, sign language because you said in the setup for this that you were particularly addressing the needs of second language learners and uh, students with disabilities. And this uh, sign language, we really, if we are really going to address the needs of um, the students with disabilities accessing a, an advanced diploma, this is a biggie. 
it's, it's a biggie and it needs to start at middle school. So, um, and that was the last question I had. First, I wanna say thank you again to both of you, to everybody who's working on this, all the teachers who made recommendations. But you said in particular that this, these changes were addressing the needs of second language learners and students with disabilities, and I couldn't quite figure that out from looking at the classes. What, what are we doing specifically to address the needs of those two populations that we know we still have work to do with? Yeah, so there are a couple of courses in particular. One is the Earth Science is being divided into Earth Science Part 1 as well as Earth Science Part 2 that will allow students to get um, two science credits, one in year one and one in year two of that course, whereas traditionally they've only been able to garner one. So that is a benefit. And then the other ones that you see um, are around intro to biology, intro to earth science, um, and some of the others that are specific to Arlington community. So as students are coming in and they need the boost in their language before they actually enroll in the course where they're taking the end of grade assessment, it gives them that intro coursework to build their language before they get into that. So that supports our English learners as well okay. so those are some so specific with students examples. with disabilities one area in addition mm -hmm. to language mm -hmm. that I consistently hear a complaint about is mathematics mm -hmm. and we actually got we all actually eliminated mm -hmm. that exact same approach to having math be taught over an extended mm -hmm. period of time so those students could get a standard diploma so is there any consideration to going back to that approach have we done that we took because we yeah. weren't getting, they weren't getting credit for two years of math. In the science, we can get two years, years of science, but we were I'm just talking able. about passing the gateway class of algebra mm -hmm. for a standard diploma for students with disabilities. So I just, I'm raising that because I've heard that a lot, both from parents yeah. and teachers at the secondary level, that because we put that back into one year rather than splitting it over two, mm -hmm. it made it harder for students with disabilities to get over that hump of the Algebra one class to get the standard diploma. And so. that, that actually may be something that we'll find out a little bit more on Thursday about because mm -hmm. I know the State Board is um, looking at that um, in relationship to splitting the classes or breaking those mm -hmm. classes and Down giving you a, a, a separate yeah. credit Thank for you. each one. Thank you. You still have to earn the verified credit though. But you, mm -hmm. but you could take it in a paced way. And, it, and it's, po it's a consideration. I right. just want to yeah. make note of that. Thank you. Okay, right. great. Well, thank you all. It's been a very robust conversation. Yes. I should say robust, not a very robust. It's been a robust <laughs> conversation. I don't think the very had any meaning in that. It's getting a little late. Thank you all so much. Um, I just want to make a couple very quick comments. Sure. Um, so first, and um, I, I appreciate Dr. Murphy's point about the, the issue with, you know, we've got teachers and staffing and such, and I just want to confirm your proposed program of study changes are budget neutral. We're not adding specialty staff that are somehow going to sort of uh, increase our overall staffing. They're budget neutral. And one of the issues then with fast expansion might be that we'd have to sort of um, uh, hire some specialty teachers. So um, I'm also um, really excited about these, you know, uh, African American studies and ideas like that. Um, when you said earlier um, about how this is our general statement. We want to make sure all students are challenged and engaged. That's what we say all the time. And apparently, you know, we have student surveys and we ask students, do you feel challenged? Do you feel engaged? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I just for, you know, when, in your free time when you want to think about another thing, um, what do they really mean by that when they say they're not challenged and engaged? I actually am not sure, having raised, you know, middle schoolers myself, that when they say they're bored, and we hear all the time, we have people come into office hours, their kids are bored in school. I'm not convinced that when they say they're bored, the solution is that they want more advanced classes, always. Some do, absolutely. Um, but what I do think, and, and we just had an event here the other night, a bunch of high school kids from every high school, so diversity conversations, and I remember one of the students talking about how boring it is to sit in lectures. And the fact is, I think, you know, what we really maybe want to start thinking about is how we're teaching our kids. And um, we've had these great demonstrations of project-based learning yes, that you guys are exactly building right. up. And so, uh, you know, I would just love to, to, and I know you've got STEAM and some other things going on. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, that's just a comment. You don't need to respond at all. Um, but I would love to see some stuff like that. I also just want to say I'm really excited about Chorus. 
<laughs> that the choral program is expanding. Um, that's great integrated learning. It's history and poetry and language and uh, in addition to music, really great stuff. And it sounds like our middle school programs are, are um, thriving if, if we're adding that a new level. Both middle school and high school, there's, mm -hmm. there, there are additions to both. So excited about that. Um, we will now move on. Thank you so much. May I say one thing just yes, about the project-based yes. learning? I think as you talk about that, and we've had some of these conversations, is that as we build project-based learning and we build more interdisciplinary work, we're going to see a lot of that increased engagement. And it may not show up in the program of studies pieces, right? There's not going to be a project-based learning course. But within the courses that are here and within the courses that are there, that's the kind of pedagogy that we want to see in our classrooms every day yes. that we're working with our teachers to build. And, and we so do want to follow clarify, that somehow. It doesn't always show up, right? right. But we will want to see it somehow. Because yes. I think that, that's, right. that's definitely that's exactly something we want right. to keep track of and support. Yep. So Agreed. as we go forward, we want to find ways yeah. to share that. So Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to move on, I think, to a construction item. So, and so you guys are finally off the hook there. One final item, and, and thank you, Mr. Meekle, for your patience. Um, we have a request for Gunston Supplementary Heating Work and Controls. Dr. Murphy. Yes, I'll turn here to uh, Mr. Meekle on this particular topic, and I also want to thank him. Uh, we had some issues uh, last year um, in relationship to the HVAC system down at Gunston. I know the team has been working very diligently, and I think this is part of that package to kind of uh, begin to address uh, that HVAC issue there at Gunston. So thank you, Mr. Meekle, and I'll let you move on forward with the uh, presentation. Thank you. Good evening. And the good news, if I'm at the podium, we're probably close to the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, so hopefully this is a fairly brief um, issue that I'm bringing to you. Um, I, I need to apologize for coming twice with this. I went back after you gave us the approval the previous time for the pre-fees for heating, and when I got the team together, um, they quickly realized that they probably should have included a lot more of the installation in this initial phase. So it's on me, I should have picked up at that time. Um, Dr. Murphy alluded to us sometimes moving at a great pace, and this is probably a case of uh, that. So no excuse, apologies. The bottom line is to, to get the, the best value out of it, we should actually do a bunch of this additional pre-work right now when we're uh, putting the new boilers in. Um, and so I come back and ask you for an additional 300,000. This is all money that will come out of the full budget that we present to you hopefully in the next month or six weeks uh, for the, the entire project. So anything we've done so far and this additional piece is all going to be money that comes off that amount. Um, I really, with that, any specific questions? Okay. Thank you for keeping it short, and we really appreciate your uh, mea culpa there. That's, right. that's uh, very nice. Um, board colleagues, questions? Oh, um, Ms. Elliott, do we have any speakers? <laughs> Doesn't look like it. Okay, uh, questions and comments from the board? Ms. Ms. Van okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep us here a little bit longer. So I got confused because I went back and was looking at what we improved in the past. And you're saying that this $300,000 is part of the money that we already approved, or is it in addition it's to the money? It's an additional $300,000. So you approved, I think, there was $400 for a pre-cooling phase. There was another 200 and some thousand for a pre-heating phase to buy the boilers, essentially. And those combined to take us over the 500000 which made us have to come to you. Um, and so this is an additional 300,000. So that would take us up to somewhere in the region of 900,000 already committed on the project. That 900,000 will then come out the X million that we come with uh, with a full budget shortly. So there's a X million dollar budget for this project at Gunston and this is within the overall budget that we were anticipating for the this project? This is certainly within the overall budget, yes. Are there more $300,000 items coming? Um, so we had a very serious conversation with the engineers. I don't expect to be back here before I come back with a full budget. And the full budget will be several million dollars. This is a major installation over a two-year period. But at this point, you feel like you're within the, you are on track to be within the overall budget. This isn't a surprise of, oops, we, we didn't see this. Not at all. I mean, again, we should have forced the issue with the engineers to make sure they told us when I came the last time, we should have done it all in one step. So it's just timing. It's timing. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very patient. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Goldstein. Uh, thank you. I think that was my question, but let me just. You might be able to make up 10 more, so. Yeah. We sit here long well, let, let me just try and phrase it in words of one syllable uh, for myself. Um, we're limited by the bond authority, and so we don't, we're not talking about an overrun here, right? No. no okay. Not yet. I, I, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what I'd like to do at this point is, Ms. Peterson, you and I spoke about this earlier today. Could you kind of please walk us through the original budget, what the um, initial proposal was, and then where we are today uh, with this project? Sure. Thank you. That would be uh, helpful. In this AAP, we have several projects that are not major construction projects in the same way that building a new school or an addition is. Um, we have projects in the CIP for our maintenance department to do HVAC, roofing, uh, and other infrastructure work that are authorized by bond funding. Um, the maintenance department, Mr. Meekle, then takes the bond funding that he has available over the next several years and plans out projects. Gunston is one of those projects. We have the bonding authority to do HVAC project at Gunston for the amount of money that Mr. Meekle needs for the Gunston project, whatever that might be. Right now, we need some of that money up front to do this pre-work, and then when he comes back to you with the total budget for the project to replace the HVAC at Gunston, he'll have the budget for this piece already used and then the rest of the budget will just come from the, the bonding authority that has already been approved for HVAC projects. And uh, we don't know the total project budget yet. We won't know that until you come back in Not yet, right. It's weeks. being designed and then when it's, once it's put out to bid we'll have an idea. And what's the, the ceiling on the bonding authority? Uh, it's several million dollars. I think it's seven and Seven or seven and eight. For yeah, it's not years. just the current. Uh, it's not just the, the, the um, upcoming bonding authority. We've basically been saving some of the bonding authority, anticipate having to do both uh, Gunston and uh, Randall simultaneously. So between what we have now and what we have coming, we think we'll just about make it. We won't know in absolute for, with absolute certainty until we get the actual final budgets. They're being put together as we speak. The, the, you said that you would be, uh, you needed for this fall and winter, right? This piece, this piece, yes. Uh, yeah, this piece, which means that it's been the bond, the bond money that was approved in. The money is already there. Yes. It's, the bond authority has already been given by the voters, right? And in men, in most cases, the bonds have already been sold to do these projects. We may need some. We'll probably get some money from the spring sale of this next bond. For, this, for these projects as well. But this is all well within our bonding authority that has already been approved by the voters and the amount of bonds that we sell each year for these projects. Uh, okay, so the next bond that Jim just uh, alluded to, which would be November of 18, that will be we, don't, we, don't need, we don't need that for this. No. Jim. Um, well, Just let me speak to this. Sorry, yeah. This is my area. I won't talk about HVAC systems, and I will talk about the bonding. Every year, every bond, there is money set aside for HVAC roofing and infrastructure projects okay. that the voters approve. Two years ago, they approved bonding authority for the next two years. So that was the spring of 17 sales and then the spring of 18 sales. In the fall of 18, they'll approve additional funding for projects that will then sell, be sold in the spring of 19 and the spring of 20. He's working on a project that we're gonna do right now with bond funding that has already been determined by the voters and will be sold, has been sold or will be sold in the spring of 18. Okay, and it'll be done over the looking next forward two summers. to be done uh, at Gunston over the next two summers. Okay, thank yes, you. Ms. Peterson, I'm, based on what I'm hearing, um, would it, we're voting on this in two weeks, I assume. Yes. Um, would it be possible before then to 
develop a spreadsheet or something that kind of lays out a little bit, you know, sure. it's, instead of us hearing that this all fits. I'm going to, to I'm going to recommend that we bring this back as an action item. Normally we put it on consent, but we'll go ahead and bring an update. And I think yeah. we can kind of show the the uh, the revenue Both streams funds. and yes. then how they go. I do want to I do want to point one thing out and I think we just have to be obvious about this or uh, realize that while this is all planned, the possibility of these bids coming in over um, is reality, especially in today's climate. So uh, we haven't gone out to bid. They're in the process of, uh, you know, the final design, uh, which will come up with, a, you know, an initial cost, uh, but then we have to go through the bid process. So let us come back to you with, with, with these revenue streams laid out and the timelines, um, which I think will be helpful for the board. And it sounds like a, a, a picture of the full budget, what the, what the right. full project entails, and then where those funds are coming from. That would be... I think very helpful. And I would just members. like to remind oh. the board that we do not undertake projects that require yes. additional bonding authority from the voters midway through the project. Right. We, may, we right. ensure that we have all of the authority and all of the bonding that we need prior to undertaking. Yeah, yeah. I got to tell you, it was, it was um, Mr. Meekle is so transparent. It was the use of the, the, the capitalization of the, in addition, I think that, you know, if, if, yes. if, you, if you hadn't been so transparent, I'm not sure there'd be as many questions, but um, Ms. Oh, no, yeah, can't, can't promise I, that. Ms. Talento. I won't take long and I, I don't have a question, but I, have a, I, was, I, think, I think I understand and I would just like you to clarify for me. And I know that when I started, one of the things that I was confused about is how bonds work. And we spoke about that, and I, under, I think I understand it now. So what you said makes perfect sense to me. And for the community who, much like myself, had an idea of what bonds were but didn't really understand them, when we vote on a bond on election day every two years, we approve that we are willing to go out and sell loans. In other words, we go out to a creditor and say, can you let us borrow some money? Here's our excellent AAA credit rating. And the people out there bid on it and say, well, we will let you borrow a million dollars at 2%. Well, we're going to let you borrow a million dollars at 2.5%. We're going to let you borrow a million point five dollars at 2.5% and you have in whatever package they provide us. And if we approve a bond for $5 million, we don't have $5 million that day. We have to sell it as we need it. The hope is always that we will never need the full $5 million, and we sell it in pieces. And so right now, we have, sold some of, we have sold some of this. We have a little bit of that money that was approved, and we're using that money to fund this piece of the Gunston project. And we approved X amount of money, and Mr. Miko is graciously coming today and asking us, we need a little bit more of that money that we have on that we sold from our first section of bond. Yes. And we still have a lot more money to fund this full project. Yes. Correct? But we don't know what that is yet because we have to go put it out for bid so that people can say we're going to do the whole HVAC system at Gunston for this much money. And then you'll come back to us and say we found the best bid. It's $3 million. Great. We're going to now sell the other piece of our bond to fund that piece. Correct? You are exactly right. Okay, so there's no over budget unless we exceed what we can sell in bonds at the time and we need to have money from someplace else come in to fund a project yes. because the cost rose in the process or we found out that the boiler we thought didn't need to be replaced actually does need to be replaced and it wasn't in our original cost of the project. Yes. Is that a correct description? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. I greatly appreciate it. All right. I think that we are concluding that, and um, I think we're at our final item, new business. Is there any new business? Please don't tell me it's someone's birthday. No. Okay. All right. Yes, let's sing happy birthday. Let's sing would happy like birthday. To stay after adjourning, after adjourning, if anyone would like to sing happy birthday, we would, I'm sure that Dr. Murphy would appreciate it. We are adjourned. Oh